Wonderful. Okay. Awesome. I'll jump straight into it. So when we think the Citation C10, which got launched in February this year, we have to think where biotech have come from. So in 2013, biotech pioneered the concept of cell imaging combined with multi-mode detection with the citation line of cell imaging multi-mode readers. So everything from citation one, three, five, seven, and now the citation C10 combining spinning disc confocal microscopy, basically bring it to every laboratory since the footprint is so small. So within this, we have uh, complementary data sets building a comprehensive story. And that's through four key components, the quad monochromator, the wide field fluorescence, wide field transmitted light, and also confocal microscopy. I'll touch on this just a little bit, but Lisa Sircombe, who will come after Kayleen in the session, will go into this in much greater detail than I'm I want to today, but just thought I'd bring your attention to the monochromator uh, fluorescence and the wavelength selection. So the available range is between 250 and 900 nanometers with a bandwidth of nine and 15 nanometers. So you can dial that into one nanometer increments and the selectable bandwidth has its benefits. So I'll just keep a brief and leave that for Lisa in the later session. For wide field fluorescence, the optical pathway, as you can see here, excitation light actually comes from one of the cubes here, moves through the objective, hits the sample, and the emission light is read by the camera just over here, quite conventional there. And then obviously, as you can see, the images are overlapped and the images can be analyzed in the one platform. With the wide field imaging filter cube options, we have a lot. So we have everything from DAPI all the way through to size seven. So 22 filter cubes. So if you have something bespoke or a kit that you must use, we have a, we most likely have an option for you in that regard. And complementary, complementing that, we also have a wide range of magnification range. So everything from 1.25X all the way through to 60X, as you can see here. And on the left, you can just see some objectives appear you can opt for a phase option or you can opt for a non-phase option just with the normal objective and they are Olympus objectives. So good quality objectives there. Um, just thought I would touch on here with all of those, obviously you can expand and deal with a lot of different experiments. So everything from 3D cell culture all the way through the histology, stem cell differentiation. We have two uh, range of focusing options. One is an image-based autofocus and that's the default in the instrument. Its advantage is flexible for um, flexibility to optimize for biology and spatial resolution. And it's recommended for those 3D cell cultures, uh, thick biology and the kinetic studies of 3D biology. And in contrast to that, we have a laser-based autofocus. You can see a cute little animation from a laser, a laser autofocus cube where the speed is approximately 50% faster than image-based autofocus. It's highly reproducible um, and reliable, and it lowers the phototoxicity and photo bleaching. So when we think standard bright field, um, the light moves through an open aperture a condenser and then moves through the objective and hits the camera and then you receive an image. Um, what Biotech have pioneered is a high contrast bright field method with a closed aperture and condenser, where this is ideal for cell counting, high contrast and greater depth of field. And this is a great application for image analysis through the Gen 5 platform, which we have. So it adds that additional contrast, which improves cellular analysis and that label-free measurement. So cell count, proliferation, cell toxicity and confluence. Color bright field optical pathway. It involves some RGB LEDs moving through a condenser and hitting the camera and then receiving the signal in the end. Uh, h &E stains are not forgotten. And um, as you can see here, represented are some stitched images. So 12, 12 by eight montage using a 60X objective. So it's not only, you know, a wide, wide view of what the slide contains, it's also got that information of 60x. So if you want to do those analysis in that, you certainly can. And this is just some examples for the intrinsic color that can be faithfully rendered. So a lot of different sample types um, being resolved in there. 
the image quality and quantitative measurements obviously is there for um, wide field. But when it comes to the improved uh, imaging through confocal imaging, as you can see by the two, they will appear, the two options here, the wide field on the left, you can see here, it is resolving it quite well, where you can see the contour and you can see the contour mask um, over the sample, but on the right compared, we can actually see improved cellular metrics. So some of the advantages of utilizing confocal optics is really that elimination of light and also Z stacking. So you can obviously see the improved quantification metrics, such as that accurate cell counting for spheroid biology. The confocal fluorescence optical pathway, you can see laser excitation moves through some confocal uh, confocal fluorescent filter cubes, moves through the spinning disk technology to the sample biology and the emission light is received by the camera. The LDI laser light engine, it has available six laser lines within the instrument. So everything from 405 all the way through to 640. And as I mentioned, with the six laser lines, they have a corresponding filter cube. So options are there if you want to have a, um, uh, for everything from DAPI all the way through to Sci-5. Um, imaging filter cube configurations for this. So as you can see here on the screen, you can see the instruments filter cubes for the wide field are housed here and the confocal are housed here with the camera just on the side. And as I mentioned with the plate reader functionality, the plate reader will actually be situated inside the instrument. So nothing uh, external, nothing additional to the bench space needs to be added. And with the computer and the tower of the computer and the computer screen and everything, the bench space, including the instrument is about two meters. So it's a very small footprint. Uh, just some examples comparing wide field versus confocal imaging. Here you can see a lung cancer spheroid at 20X and you can really see the improved uh, detail from the confocal, especially from the core of the organoid compared to the wide field on the left. And same with the zebrafish tail neurons using the same uh, objective, so 20X. Uh, Whitefield does a really good job at imaging through, but as you can see, when we move through Z, a little bit of out of focus light comes through. And this is where confocal really shines and spinny disc technology really shines. So as I mentioned, wide field on confocal imaging to suit any application here, you have the option for wide field, which really increases that speed and image intensity. But when you opt for confocal, you get an achieved better signal to noise and also that resolved detail. And as I mentioned, we have several different capturing options, Z stacking and montage. And if we combine those two together, we get full XYZ coverage for a sample. And again, with the capturing options, it's not limited to just slides or one vessel or anything. You can utilize that through a batch mode. So either the same protocol over the one plate or different protocols over the one plate, for instance, if you so need. If our biology doesn't play nice and isn't in the exact position that we want it to be, in the well, like the zebrafish, as you can see, we can actually um, choose to offer beacons where we can select the area where the zebrafish are and then just go away and image those in a high throughput fashion, which is great. Uh, the capturing options for kinetics. So as you can see on the left, it's just a assay over time, but on the right, this is probably one of my most favorite uh, videos ever. I think just the zebrafish embryo um developing over time i think it's really great it's one of the things that you know uh, kinetics and live cell imaging really shines here uh i mentioned phase contrast uh objectives and this is just an example of uh, two options where a 10x and a 20x on two different tissue samples here and if you don't want to opt for those phase objectives um, you can see traditional phase on the left, but also through Gen 5, the Gen 5 platform, you can opt for a digital phase contrast application, which can be applied post acquisition. And again, driven all through the power of the Gen 5 software. So really, e really easy, seamless and flexible, um, really getting down to this. So this software actually drives the microscope as well as does the analysis. So it's a very linear process, not having to learn several different softwares to get your endpoint analysis done. And the 3D visualization with some um, optimal deconvolution, as you can just see some samples there. 
um, really great for visualize, visualizing your 3D data sets. And just to touch on some export file formats, we're not locked down to one file format or a proprietary file format. It can be exported as a JPEG, a TIFF or an MP4, if you so wish to take it to a different analysis program. Just thought I would touch on some complementary technologies, so several different modes of detection. On the right, I saw, I've spoken about all the different augmented um, microscopy applications, and Lisa will go through the multi-mode plate reader functionality, but I just thought I would touch on the additional options that can be included in the Citation C10 or with the Citation C10. The CO2 and O2 gas controller, dual injectors, joystick and biostack. So modulating that gas concentration, uh, dispensing some drugs if you so wish, moving through the stage with the joystick and the automated workflow with the biostack. And just thought I would show the biostack here just to show where the robot is actually performing, where the plates are housed and everything there. Uh, the lab web versatility going into the instrument, it isn't locked down to, as I mentioned before, just one or two. We have a multi-vessel adapter for those prototype or 3D printed uh, vessels, everything from slides, multiple dishes, and also multiple plates as well can go into the instrument. Uh, the BIOS bar 8 is an automated incubator, which is now compatible with the Citation C10, has eight drawers, uh, which you can then automate your uh, live cell imaging experiments over time. So that is the end of my presentation. I thought I would finish on a beautiful globe with everything surround all the different applications surrounding the globe here. Just to touch on that, you can certainly email me and we can go through some different applications at the Citation range and also the Citation C10 can actually perform and how it can benefit you. And yeah, that's me. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Kim. Has anyone got any questions? You can um, put up your hand or just shout out or talk. Um, thanks so much for that. I um, I really love the comparisons of the the wide field versus the confocal, seeing them side by side, mm -hmm. and those uh, yeah, and those beacons and the um, that zebrafish uh, video always reminds me of um, my first time in um, Adele Woolley's lab when I hadn't yeah. seen them and she actually left me with the instrument while she went to have lunch because I was enjoying <laughs> watching them so much. Nice. <laughs> um, Okay, if there's no questions, we might actually move on. I'll no introduce problem. Kayleen because just for time. Uh, but please, anyone, um, put the questions in the chat. We can answer them at the end of the session. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Kayleen Simpson, um, Associate Professor Kayleen Simpson, I should say. Uh, Kayleen is a molecular cell biologist who specialised in breast cancer and metastasis while uh, doing a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and now heads the Victorian Centre for Functional Genomics at Peter Mac in Melbourne. Um, the VCSG enables researchers to perform unbiased uh, target discovery using high throughput approaches, including CRISPR, RNAi, and compound screening in both 2D and 3D, underpinned by sophisticated cell phenotyping using high content imaging. Uh, and there's a very strong collaborative approach at the VCFG and a wide diversity of researcher goals, uh, meaning that the facility must remain at the leading edge of innovation in science and technology. So thanks again, Kayleen, and can't wait to hear more, more about this and taking functional genomics to the next level. Thanks, Lana. It's lovely to see you and uh, to see people I've met in New Zealand, and I kind of wish I was actually in New Zealand, i got to say, I'm all having to do from my kitchen. Um, right, so can everyone see what I've got on the screen? Yeah. Sure right. can. Okay, so I sort of, I'm working on the assumption that I'm relatively unknown to the majority of the people on this so call. Um, I'm going to take you through what our lab does and make some specific references to the gear that's relevant to today's talk. And Cameron's done an excellent job of introducing it. So I don't have to do so much work in that regard. So the VCFG is a genome-wide or targeted phenotyping and drug screening facility. So we're based at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, right embedded in the uh, Parkville precinct with the university and the Walter Eliza Hall Institute and all of the um, hospitals there. For us, we're a team of eight. Um, we're really driven around innovative technology development. We've got a lot of reagent collections, but we're very researcher focused. So we engage with the researcher. We're accessible to everyone, um, both within here and, and New Zealand, certainly. Um, we have collaborations outside of those places as well, but the whole goal for us is to help you get your best project you can. 
So our focus has been always 2D and born out of RNAi. Many years ago, we've adapted much of what we've done in a 2D RNAi setting to a CRISPR setting. We also have uh, viral CRISPR as well, and that was really backed on to the fact that we had viral RNAi in the years gone by. We do a lot of compound and drug screening, and I'm going to show you today more of the focus of what we've been doing in the 3D setting that's really quite um, exciting work that we're pushing forwards now. We've always been underpinned by high content imaging. Um, that sort of makes up the bulk of what we do these days. Still some sort of plate reader based screens, but primarily imaging. We've got a lot of automation in the lab and I'll show you some pictures of those in a minute. Um, we do a lot of customized image analyses. Um, really that's come from the fact that every project is so distinct that we have to set up basic pipelines and then model that around what the, the question is. And we've got a um, project management portal we call Prime, which is one of that Lassian Confluence suite of um, software tools, which means that everything we do with any researcher is embedded um, in the one spot. So everything around the image analyses, the barcodes of the plates, the, uh, the, the grant funding, every part of what we do is a shared project portal so that it's there for perpetuity, which is really important. Because we still see screens from the, say, 2013 we published last year. So it can take a really long time to get to that end game. So just in a little bit more depth, um, you know, we're an infrastructure lab, of course, but in my mind, infrastructure is equipment, it's reagents and it's expertise. And I think often the expertise gets overlooked in that, uh, you know, you build a team of people that are very, very good at what they do and we're there to help um, everybody do their experiments. We are a complete service, so we sit at the front end of designing your projects, talking how to, how to generate a grant idea into an actual functional um, process of um, budgeting and, and something realistic. We're then there to execute those projects with you, and then we're there to analyze those projects. So for my mind, it's much about training the next generation. So we operate this researcher embedded model primarily, where someone comes, we train them on all of the gear. Um, there'll be some bits we run, some bits that you would never run. Um, but part of that is so that people know exactly what they're doing. They know their cells better than anyone else. They know their biological question. They can actually run the whole gamut of the process with us. We have a major focus on technology innovation. So I'm not a group leader that focuses on breast cancer per se, but we do use breast lines as our sort of baseline model, but we're always trying to build the next, um, the next leap for us to, to be able to either do that in collaboration with someone or build it on the models that we have as sort of standard in the lab, but to be able to drive change um, so that that benefits people that come in. So that's part of that frontier of method development and analysis strategies. The pleasure of having this job is that we get to tackle diverse biological questions. So people come with everything and we get to have the pleasure of helping them. Uh, and really you will see now that we're really moving towards translation, particularly in the 3D space. And obviously being within a cancer hospital helps enormously in that regard. So to set the scene of what is functional genomics, I think you can read most of those. So I'm not going to read it out, but you know, the Google definitions vary a little bit. But really for me, it's a genome-wide approach or a large scale approach that uses high throughput technologies that can assay many functions and relationships simultaneously. And at the end of the day, it's looking at the big biological picture in an unbiased way. And for me, you know, I do lots of little um, tours of the lab and when you're bringing it down to the bottom line, it's letting the biology tell the story. So moving away from what you think you know or that it's only that particular pathway and actually opening the door and saying, well, what else might it be? Particularly in a cancer setting, we know patients relapse. So what we thought we knew may not be the whole story. So it's really about um, opening your mind, being unbiased and, and pushing forwards. So I look at it this way as well. When we're talking about screening and high throughput screening, it's this inverted triangle over on the right here where we go from basically a lot to a little. Um, we have a primary screen where it could be thousands of genes using CRISPR or NAR or thousands of compounds, hundreds of thousands of compounds even. We do that primary screen in a certain basal setting and then we use statistics and a lot of analysis strategies um, to come down to a triaged hit list. And that triage hit list still is in the end game. We then will modulate our way through that with more cell lines or different types of biological questions all related to the, to the primary um, focus of our, our research to get us down to this tertiary screening point where we want 10 
at best. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I don't have enough hips. It's like, well, how many do you want? If it's a good screen and it's nice and robust, you've still got hips to focus down on. So when we do this, we talk about assay readouts, and this is where the equipment comes really important. Plate reader-based screens, viability, biochemical, um, reporter readouts, interaction studies, all of those can be done on the, on the gear that um, Cameron just mentioned. Quantitative high content imaging, we can do basic cell viability, we can go right full scale up into multiplex morphology, and I'll show you those in a moment. I'm not going to talk at all on pooled strategies today other than to say it still follows the same strategy. It's a lot down to a little. But no screen stands alone. And I think it's actually, the, given we're in New Zealand, uh, the hunt for the wilder people, the no child, what is the one about the no child or left behind line? <laughs> Sorry. I used to say a screen is figure one, uh, but really the emphasis here is just to say that we are part of the, the bigger omics um, precincts, right? Uh, Multi-omics, integrative omics, uh, functional genomics just is one part of that. If we sequence, we need to know the functional outcome of that. We need to overlay lipidomics, proteomics, metabolomics. All of these omics form part of the big picture. We will also suggest that you get your screen outcomes and you overlay with patient data if it's available. There's public databases out there everywhere that you can actually then focus down a little more on the hit list so you can, you can get to that end game faster. So what sort of instruments do we need in a functional genomics lab? Um, my favorite is the personal liquid handling workstations. They, they are the all singing, all dancing, everything you would do in the lab by hand, it can do for you. So cell so dispensing, media changing, fixing and staining. These are vital. Um, they minimize your um, errors. Any errors that you can introduce by yourself in any of these screening campaigns should be uh, as minimal as possible. So instruments like this are just at, at the heart of it, fundamental. Then there's big robotics. Um, we've got two major uh, platforms that we use. Um, they have large plate capacities. They've got lots of flexibility in the way that we can move around the robot deck so we can put our CRISPRs and our RNAi library plates on, our compound plates on, have as many daughter plates as we need. It's a little bit of a game of Tetris as we shuffle things around on the deck, but they're highly precise and we're usually operating in very small volume ranges, often in the one microliter dose range. Plate readers, critical. Uh, basic and advanced functionality, kinetic, we do a lot of as well, and they've got to be fully automated, as Cameron showed you before. We've got a full suite of microscopes, so I'll go through in a minute, um, with different specificities, live imaging, wide field imaging, confocal imaging, full range of magnifications, um, but they're all high throughput and they're all automated. And, you know, it's actually quite a thing to see some of the, the images that Cameron showed just before. Back in the day when I started the lab, you know, 13 and more than 13 years ago now, um, you know, we never said that they were a microscope that you would see in a classical microscopy facility where you have a focused and beautiful picture. They were high throughput and we were there to get them done quickly and to quantify. Now you can actually do both. You can get those front cover nature pictures as well as the high throughput that capacity that you need. The other things I threw in here is an automated plate sealer. That's like top of the tree. We need to be able to um, seal everything so nothing evaporates. And um, we love our little um, uh, competitor, but it's a flexible, easy to use drug dispenser from TCAN. It's um, the D300E. We use that all the time, loading our controls on plates while we're using the big robotics to deliver our screens. So what do they look like? Um, Got to say this one over here, it's 13 years old, still going strong. Uh, and we now have three of these Biotech 406 automated um, dispensers. Um, so, um, so they can aspirate and dispense this unit here. And here's one on the bench. So we use this one because we ran out of space in the hood to just do um, uh, endpoint fixing and staining. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't need to be sterile, but every all of the other ones sit in hoods like this. And we have one of the new multi-flow FXs that we use for our 3D work. So it's super flexible. We can position the head anywhere. Uh, we can speed it, slow it down as slow as we absolutely need, um, but we can do any type of plate format on that. And then here's our citation. So we actually own a citation three, mind you. And um, I did say to Sharon one day, why we, we sound like we're buying Mazda cars here. It's a site three, then it became the five, then the seven. I don't think Mazda have a 10, so that's good news for you guys. But anyway, we own a three and we loved our three so much that we um, moved it upstairs and justified the reason for getting a citation five was that we wanted to do some 3D imaging. 
And that went so well that we then got the citation C10. And so we have two now that primarily are, um, of course, our basic and, and sophisticated plate readers, but are there for um, more than anything, our um, 3D platforms. So we recently installed the bias bar that Cameron just showed before. So it's awesome. It's got eight plates here um, that we can run. So pretty much for us, this doubles our capacity. So people access the site five during the daytime and then we will park plates in it and image in the night and image across the weekend. So um, it's a fantastic uh, add-on for us. Eventually we'll add that onto the site 10, but you can see here that we're, we're housing a bias stack on that for the moment. So how does it look like when we're doing screens? We call this arrayed screening. We're working predominantly in a 384 well format. And you can see here a stylized little plate where usually we've got controls on the left and the right sides of the plates. This is a drug plate where you can see different doses across it, but it's the same for uh, any of the modalities that we're using. You've got your agent in the plate and you use a big robot like this to deliver it into all of your daughter plates that will usually have cells in them if it's a drug or you may be adding cells at the same time if you're doing RNAi or CRISPR. We then leave that for three to seven days as though everything in this setting is fairly acute. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and image. The shot here that you see is our Salomics platform. So our other high content imaging suite is, is Salomics, whether that's our LED or our LZR laser confocal. But if we're doing 3D, we're focusing on using the Site 5 or the Site 10. And we also own the Incusite SX5 that we usually use to do growth kinetics on cells in 2D prior to doing any screening. And then we go through our data analysis customized pipelines. So you can see here imaging on the left, plate reader sort of functionality readout on the right. And what can you do with that? Um, Sharon's heard me say this many, many times, but I'm always the eternal optimist and I will say anything. Um, and actually on the left, this is a list of the things that we have done and it's not a complete list, but just to give you a sense of what's possible, um, you know, basic things, cell viability, synthetic lethality, just measuring cell viability, um, but more sophisticated than that, we're doing combinatorial screening now. So we might be doing um, transfection with uh, CRISPRs and then adding on CAR T cells, for example, and looking for permissive infection in that regard. So there's all sorts of things that you can do. Really, the imagination is your limit. And the, the best part about screening is that it's unique to you. you know, the way you set it up and the way you think about your biological question is the sophisticated um, sort of end game that, that no one else is going to have like you. So I just quickly touch on the libraries that we have. Um, we still use RNAi. Um, you know, it got a bad rap for having off target effects, but then we know how they work. I think that perhaps it's lesser or more dangerous to think that CRISPR doesn't have too many off target effects. We just haven't actually understood them totally, but we've got both libraries now. So they both come from Dharmacon Horizon Discovery. Um, this is very old, but still very functional. This we have got only this year. So CRISPR edit R library has three single guide RNAs per gene per well. So we're working in a pooled strategy. We've got a sort of flexible screen um, concentration endpoint. We always screen in duplicate. If we're doing these CRISPR libraries, we're talking about 61 plates to cover the whole genome, which is just shy of 19,000 genes. We put a lot of technical controls on here. Um, and again, this idea of what's your biological question, and I showed you all those assays, um, what's really important is that the assay reflects the question and the cell line reflects the question. So there's no point looking at breast cancer and using healer cells just because they're easy to work with and they grow like, you know, like weeds. It's got to be something as specifically, you know, uh, if you're measuring cell motility or wound healing, for example, um, you've got to really think about how to make those two um, things really marry up to give you the best outcome. So I just wanted to give you um, the, the workflow that we use now for imaging and to say that in the old days, here's an imaging example where we've got P53 stained when we knock down this uh, RPS19, you can see increases in P53, otherwise not so much in this cell line. We go and look at QC and validate and here's our negative controls all the way down here and our positive controls are looking lovely and everything's aligned and great. And then we get this massive waterfall plot where we've got everything Z scored. So our statistical standardized normalization, we've got some hits down here that reduce P53 and some hits up here that increase P53. P53. But that could be uh, at least 400 hits, if not more. And we would usually scale it to say, take the top 400. But from there, we've got to do our tertiary screen and we've got to work out 
a relationship we might go through the the um, um what are they called the interactome networks and so on and all the published data and sort of find anything that might be related so that we can hone out hit this down but it's a really cumbersome way of doing things so now life is much better with cellular phenotyping so this is just showing you the parallels that we can do this in a 2d setting here and a 3d setting here 2d it's called cell painting so every one of these is a slightly different color a computer identifies slightly different colors so we can mark every single cell so we can do the most simplest form we can do viability toxicity cell cycle using our imaging or we can do something far more sophisticated which is to identify cell features so i've only got some that makes sense here um, there's at least a thousand cell features using the cell profiler software in you know intensity of your signal changes in cell shape <clears throat> texture topography of the surface um, it's got more technicality behind it than that but it's actually a really strong predictor of, of shape change how close cells are to each other is also a predictor here you can see in a 3d setting we've got you know staining intensity whether there's a lot or, or less whether the, the texture is smooth or, or or not so we go and do those cell feature extractions we then use sophisticated um, bioinformatics um, primarily we're programming in r to throw out anything that's like each other so we want to find those that are grouped in the same but very different to the controls and we come up with these feature fingerprints so out of the thousand features we might come down to 30 or 50 but you can see that there's a, a profile for this loop group and a profile for this group and just as an illustration here you can see the differences between them so they actually are grouping things that have the same um same phenotypes and look the same and then from there it's back into your standard biological pathways that you would normally take any sort of um, detailed um, look into this is just a, an illustration we did very early on with the mda mb231 cells we made ourselves a known um, reference library of compounds we went through the whole um, pipeline that i showed you before and we were really pleased to see that through hierarchical clustering we actually grouped all of these different mechanisms of action into the same groups and down here you can see they all look completely different and if we were going to say originally anything that's more than 50 percent dead is a hit um, well we would never have identified the different subclasses of these so these cellular features allow us to pull things out and segregate them into much more focused groups we can illustrate this here with the CRISPR screen in mcf 10 a cells where you can see here's our control staining with DAPI your whole cell stain and actin phylloden and on the right here here's our cluster phenotypes you can see they all look different we've got the poster child here for each one of those clusters and it allows us to basically say i only want to look at things that look like egfr we've got compacted cytoplasm we've got sort of almost syncytial like cell development here completely different to anything that's not where, where we see a knockout of check one but when you look at those profiles they look completely different so these imaging features are are different it allows us into the future to say well if i only want to look at things that look like this i could actually have that um, profile defined and i could go in using machine learning approaches and only pull out those things that look like this as well so there's a couple of different ways that we're working on grouping things but the point i wanted to make here is that rather than our top 400 or two percent we now are able to bring our hit list down to much lower numbers already so that we are now even more unbiased but we've got a rational hit list that says i only want to look at these ones or i only want to look at these ones anything that looks like rio kino's profile is what we're keen to go and follow up so we're not sifting through 400 now we could be sifting through 50 for example so just shifting really quickly to 3d um cameron shown us some lovely pictures of 3d before and i think that you know the tides have turned really and that most people recognize now that drug discovery in 2d will fail at clinical trials and that we need something that's more representative of the biological status of a patient so we are doing this two ways the first way is using the janus robot where we can embed cells in an automated fashion in a 3d4 plate using matrigel we can do it as this little dome layer here or we can do it as a sandwich layer we also have the raster and bioprinter from Adventure Life Sciences in Sydney, which uses a hydrogel. So this, the biggest distinction here is the matrices that they're embedded in. This is sort of the old tried and true. This is uh, a more new um, sort of idea coming that we can um, decorate the hydrogels 
with peptides that are specific for the signaling of, of the, the cell line that we're working with. So to customize it much more than the secret herbs and spices that exist in matrix gel. Right now though, we're only working in the 96 fold format in this, in this system. But here's where our citations really come to the fore. In our automated pipeline, we've developed ourselves a label-free imaging methodology because 3D can go for weeks um, before you hit that end game point. So we will seed ourselves using our Janus. We will then do daily um, live imaging in a three to four well format, deliver our drugs, and then go through um, live imaging again, right through to the end point of the project. Um, and then we go ahead and stain with Perkst and some sort of dead cell stain and, and other things that we're developing at the moment. And we also can add in cell titer glow. So we can do these um, uptake dyes, we can image them, and then we can throw cell titer glow in and get a whole well read out of viability and put that all back onto the citation five or C10. So this looks like this. We can see now um, growth over time looking beautiful. The, the structures are, are um, clearly, clearly growing. We can map that out. We can treat them. You can see here, it's a little bit hard. The colors are not too distinct, but here's our controls here continuing to grow up. And here's our um, treated cells starting to, to die off. The importance of this and doing this all in a label free and imaging every day is that we can map growth and work out exactly when is the right time to treat. So if you're just looking by, oh, you're not the least bit objective and you might say, well, the bigger, the better. And in fact, the bigger they get, the less growth you're going to see at the end of the day and the less likely they will be to taking up drugs in an active phase of growth. So this is really important to be able to look at these this way. And just to show you that on the citation uh, five, this was done, um, we can image um, in 96 well format, we were stitching together nine fields at 4X. So we're getting great resolution. We could Z stack them all. And we showed that we we're actually quite happy with either a Z0 or a Z1 point. Um, you don't obviously get every single structure, but you get a pretty good number there. And then when we have a 3D four well plate, we're using a two and a half X. Um, we just go with two Z points and we can get through that plate in about 25 minutes. So super, super quick, awesome depth of field in these microscopes. It's really, um, it's the whole reason why we've got them now to really build this 384, uh, this, this 3D pipeline. Then we found that we needed to do a little bit of tricky stuff to identify our structures. Um, so we use this um, bright field edge inversion um, so that we can now identify the structures, we can do the cell painting, we can then go and identify individual structures. You can see the dead ones here, the live ones here. We can work through that pipeline that I showed you before. We do a lot of work just trying to get measurement of cell death. And there's a real trick to that because you can see here that with sterosporin and MCF7 um, structures, uh, low dose sterosporin, fantastic looking caspase uh, activity, high dose, everything's falling apart and we don't have the same level of caspase activation because we probably have missed the imaging point window. And you can see that here again, that um, you've got, you know, you've got a good readout of caspase intensity, but what works better is looking at bright field texture that you can see straight away that that highest dose is the one that is showing the greatest change in bright field texture. So it's really very powerful to just take these imaging strategy approaches, but we also can then do it in a fluorescence way where we've got sterosporin treated again, and we've imaged with PI as an endpoint, and then we use cell titer glow. So we've got statistically very significant um, increase in um, PI in the structures and the same going down here, a very significant reduction in cell viability using cell titer glow. The other thing that we've been spending a lot of time on is thinking about cancer heterogeneity. And this comes to the fore again in an imaging way where we can measure the radius of the structures. And you can see this is using uh, prostate cancer um, PDX line and we've got different size structures. And we show in this paper down here, if anyone's interested that these different size structures respond to drugs differently. So it's really critical that we can measure and define them. And we can create these type of histograms that will allow us to look at the proportion of structures in each sort of size bracket. And then across all of them, you can see that the other challenge is that they all look different. So these are all prostate cancer grown in um, mice. Uh, and, you know, it's apples versus oranges in some regards. So at least if we're able to say, you know, we've got this proportion of large in here, we've got more small ones in here, we've got sort of more evenness, actually, um, we're able to say how things respond. We're starting to tackle that heterogeneity problem. 
I just wanted to illustrate how well the um, the phenotyping is working in, in identifying subclasses uh, of, of hits. So this is cluster four, which I just pulled out at random. Here's our uh, phenoprint here. Here's spheroid count and Herx texture as key um, dominators of this phenoprint and PI total intensity. Cluster one has a really different profile. Um, PI intensity is completely different. Um, and it is one of the dominating features that, that comes out of this profile. And then when we look at the images, it's really cool. Here's uh, the one that matches to um, cluster four signature and not a whole lot's going on. Very little in the PI intensity, um, which we saw down here, not much going on. Structures look really intact. Here, huge amount of PI, loads of death. All the structures are literally falling apart. So we were immediately able to group compounds in this group and say, well, actually we found a whole lot that are dead that look like each other. And that led us to being able to screen. And again, this is in this SLAS discovery paper where we screened three different uh, PDX cell lines and we classified them as um, highly enriched for, for death based on cell titer glow and the Herx texture variance measures. And then we've got moderate and no death. And that bears out to be quite um, informative by the imaging side of it, where you can see very toxic, potentially toxic and not toxic at all. And when we look at the phenoprints from those, um, there's a cell titer glow measure here that shows that the most toxic one has the greatest um, impact in cell, cell viability, but that the features again look completely different. So for us, we think that a combination of imaging and sometimes using cell titer glow, but not always, is going to be able to triage down our screening um, outcomes in a 3D setting beautifully. So to conclude, I'm just going to say, um, since most of you don't know uh, our screening facility, just to cover off that you need a full range of automated instrumentation in this type of high uh, throughput screening facility. And, and often, you know, in our lab, at least because we've been around for so long, we've got redundancy built into everything. We've got pretty much two of everything so that if one breaks down, um, we can keep going, but that also serves for capacity. Um, I really like a modular design. We've got four different rooms for where all of our gear goes. So you can see sometimes it's one nice big all enclosed um, cabinet and everything's in there, but it means that, you, that different people can't come in and do different things. It's all running and the one workflow has to be happening. So we, we've nailed a modular design, but fully integrated workflows are still essential so that you can provide that capacity and service. And I mentioned staff at the start, but I can't underestimate how important it is to have proficient and dedicated people to the instruments as much as they're easy to use and the software on these biotech instruments certainly is very, very um, foolproof. Uh, it's still good to have someone there that knows exactly what's going on to do the training and the support. And so just to, to last point here to say is that whilst um, it all looks beautiful that when you get to the end game, the data analysis these days is taking longer than the experiments themselves. It actually is really quite substantial to get through to those endpoints, but the depth of data we get out now is vastly superior to anything we had done many years ago. And with that, I'm just going to acknowledge two teams that um, I showed the publications and, and, and different work for that we've partnered heavily in the 3D space, the Risbridger Group from Monash and the Hollandi Lab from the University of Melbourne. We're supported nationally through NCRIS and other funding bodies and actually, this isn't even just for today, but I always acknowledge the vendors because if we didn't have them, we wouldn't be running. If they can't come and fix a bit of gear tomorrow and, and you know, the best instruments do break down, um, we wouldn't be able to do our projects. And more than that, we've partnered in a very much an academic way where there's a lot of conversation, a lot of tech growth. Um, you know, someone, you know, Sharon certainly will come and tell me, you know, I've just seen this bit of gear, you should really have a look at it. And, and so we're all working in, that, in a partnership rather than just a purchase and walk away sort of oper operation. So with that, um, I may have gone over time. I lost track of my um, <laughs> timer, but uh, I'm happy to take some questions. I'll unshare. Oh, that was a great talk, Kayleen. Thank you. I'm gonna jump in in front of Elena. I'm sorry, I have a question for you. Um, I'm kind of thinking, uh, and you just alluded to the fact that we've worked together in a partnership for quite some time. One of the things that's always um, impressed me, and I think the reason why you know, uh, you've know been able to lead the VCFG into um, the area that it is, is that we've always kind of stayed just in front of what's kind of happening, you know, really um, paying attention to what's happening in the market and, and leaping into that. And I think you know, this last couple of years, or well, last 12 months really, with getting the synthetic 
um, CRISPR, a RAID whole yep. genome library, um, the C10, the citation C10, obviously you already showed the restroom. Um, where do you see that all going? You know, we've kind of done this whole movement from 2D biology with RNAi where we were, you know, very comfortable like 10 years ago and, and that data looked awesome. And now we've really, you know, kind of ventured right into this 3D space with, and, and now bringing, you know, CRISPR into, into that um, whole, you know, sphere as well. Where do you see that going and what's that next step? You know, you mentioned that it brings it right into being more biologically relevant. Do you see there being a next phase? Yep, um, I guess the immediate phase for us right now, and, and I know that in the US, we're not, it's, not, not many people have the library that we have. We are really trying to do gene editing in, in cells embedded um, so that you, know, you can actually start to do the drug style screen with an RNAi or a CRISPR embedded. And we've got some data, I think we're gonna be able to do it. It's tricky. Um, whether we can get full penetration is another thing. If you can make your cells down to single cells, I think, and embed them, I think we can make that work. So that's the first one. And the, the other place that we're putting a lot of energy at the moment is um, the co-culture interactions. So a lot of people at work putting TILs on, CAR-Ts on, other types of immune cells and trying to build that. But that's really challenging, but still kind of primitive in that it's, it's um, an epithelial cell type and as a tumor and then an immune cell type coming on top. Um, I really would like to see us in the space of organ on a chip into the future. I think that's where we're going to be, but that won't be a high throughput sort of model. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, you know, um, very, very focused. I think one of the challenges I see at the moment is convincing the clinicians that these organoid experiments are worthwhile and that they represent patient biology, even though we say it and we know it, I think, for them to make the leap to be predictive or to go to a drug company and say, all right, we should stop doing 2D screens. We should start always doing 3D screens. That connection's not there yet. Um, you know, even the clinicians at work still go, well, it looks good, but convince me, right? And I'm like, okay, but I need more patient samples. But, you know, with the Hollandi lab, we've screened oh, close to 20 pancreatic lines now. And that, once you've got that sequence information and the drug responses, um, we then need to do combinatorial drugging. And we're doing a lot of synergy um, computational analyses at the moment. But I think what comes after that is really going to be an emphasis on machine learning. And I touched on it and I didn't have enough time to sort of show the way that we're thinking about it now, but it's really important when you even see the five different prostate lines looking so different and they'll have different sensitivities in their responses. How do we actually neutralize them so that we can work out what drug is actually effective across more than one patient? And I suppose in one way you could say, patient-derived therapy is key, and it's just one person, one response, but we still need to think a bit more generically than that as well. Right. Um, I think um, we're probably starting to run over time, so Elaine is probably going to be ringing a bell at me. So uh, I will just uh, shout out, though, to all of our wonderful folks that are in New Zealand. Um, if you need to get in contact with Kaylaine, uh, if you're interested in her services, Sing out, you can probably reach out through Elena. Uh, Elena or Fraser can put you into contact with us and we can certainly um, make those connections for you. So yeah, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, more than happy. We actually have someone funded from the University of Auckland to come and scream with us. If only he could leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> there is that <laughs> one detail, right? I mean, most of last year waiting for the green light to be able to leave, but um, we're more than happy. We've, we've done a lot with Perry Guilford. Um, we're more mm -hmm. than happy to have people chat to us if we can help or, or come and work with us. So. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, sorry, I can't stay around. I have another meeting I have to go to. I'm just going to get back into PowerPoint and switch over through there. There we go. Welcome to the world of the biotech plate readers. And I'm going to start with the hybrid multi-mode readers. Okay. So the hybrid multi-mode detection is where the biotech readers uh, truly shine. You have the uh, convenience and flexibility of the monochromator-based optics, which in turn allows you to 
utilize a vast, um, vast range of applications from absorbance, fluorescence, and luminescence. And you have that in combination with the fluorescence space optics as well. And biotech uses high bandwidth filters, so you have ultra sensitivity. And so this allows for a variety of assays through there. Um, so there's really nothing that you can't do from time resolved fluorescence, alpha fluorescence polarization, the list goes on. So what are these hybrid multimode readers? Well, there's three in the biotech range stage. We have the Synergy HT, Synergy H1, and just having a look a little bit into under the hood. So the Synergy H1 uh, is has all the flagship detection features with another level. We have the new cube design, which allows for greater application flexibility and speed. We have additional features allowing optimal Z height for your reading and detection, as well as extended dynamic range with the H1 as well, which allows you for ultra sensitivity in your assays. Next, we have the Citation 5. And the Citation 5 uh, was where Biotech took the little step into imaging that were primarily known as Citation. And it's where we have this beautiful happy medium where um, imaging and detection meet in the middle. And as uh, Kayleen says, she utilizes this in her lab quite frequently. And it's a beautiful uh, feature that you have by you can um, combine your monochromator based optics with your microscope and you can do this hit picking. So find your areas of interest through detection and then narrow down and zoom to image those cells specifically. And all is automation ready as well. And lastly, and certainly not least, is the Synergy Neo 2. So looking into this here, the Synergy Neo 2 was birthed thanks to the success of the H1 and it just took another level. And it was primarily developed with the pharmaceutical market in mind where uncompromised speed and performance were necessary. And yet it is modular and accessible. And you can see here the quad monochromator, which is fantastic back here. So all of these instruments, like I said, are modular and accessible. You can build them up or down to suit your needs. Um, so they really are available for everybody, depending on what you need. And the added feature to the H1 and the Neo just recently is they can be incubated up to 70 degrees Celsius, which allows for lamp assays now. So a great feature is the monochromators, uh, but, and that's something where the biotech readers, especially the Neo shines, but what is so great about it? Well, I'll put this view here. So in the Neo, the monochromators have a range from 250 to 850 nanometers with a bandwidth of three to 50 nanometers in one monochromator um, increments. And why is this important? Well, you can, with this variable, dial in to your excitation and emission peaks. And so using a large bandwidth, this is really powerful for providing increased sensitivity and having um, lower limits of detection. And also for your small bandwidth. A lot of fluorophores have a very uh, narrow um, seat. They can have crossover, avoiding your stoke shift. So you're going to be able to dial in specifically to the wavelengths there to avoid your uh, crosstalk and enhance your assay performance. But it's not just the monochromators. We also have in the Neo uh, dual PMTs, which are fundamental. So looking into the instrument under the hood, if you would, we can see the wonderful dual PMTs for detection, allowing you to actually perform your um, high advanced detection technologies and looking at those signals independently. So with traditional um, imaging or detection in itself, you can see that you would be uh, imaging or detecting the signals um, one by one uh, together in the one detector. 
But with the NEO2 in itself, you can actually read each individual signal and so that the measurements themselves are distinct and not only are you doing them simultaneously to uh, increase your speed, but there is uh, also reduced uh, force and signal crossover. And we'll go through there. And this is really important for your ratio metric measurements such as FRET, BRET, TRF, fluorescence polarization. It really uh, is where this shines here. Another feature that you can add into the NEO2 and the Citation 5, which is Kayleen, is a dedicated alpha laser. And this allows for ultra fast sensitivity and speed, allowing assays from alpha screen, alpha laser, alpha flux. And you can also build in a TRF laser in the NEO2. So this one here is a 337 nitrogen laser, allows for assays for TRF, HTRF lamp the screen, lance, the list goes on. You can see in this graphic here how tight the data is by using the TRF laser with beautiful Z primes here. And the signal is actually six times more uh, in a TRF laser as compared to a xenon light source. So in addition to your uh, enhanced detection, you're also going to have enhanced speed, which you can see beautifully through this image here uh, on the screen, utilizing and comparison, comparing the TRF compared to a neon laser. So in this example here, you'll see the beauty of where your hybrid optics can shine. Looking at a kinase, you can use a absorbance based method, alpha screen, luminescence, and time results fluorescence, all to look at kinases and you can use this diverse strategy to answer your research questions. So utilizing these technologies uh, to your advantage. But it's not just that where this stops here, this uh, image, I hope it's not too overwhelming, but really this shows the power of all of the applications that you can utilize as thanks to the hybrid technology in biotech range. On to the next, the, our next destination is the multi-mode readers of the biotech range. And there's three here. We have the Synergy HDX, the Citation 7, and the Synergy Analytics. And these multi-mode readers have dual optics, so a monochromator-based absorbance and filter-based fluorescence. So the Synergy HDX is our flagship um, detection. So it is our most common multi-mode reader and uh, it is a great, it has the flagship, it allows you to do pretty much most of the detection assays which you would be wanting to do in your laboratory as well you can use alpha and TRF in these instruments. There you go. And of course, incubation as well. The Citation 7 uh, was developed with the immunology market primarily in mind. You can actually add a inverted microscope in here to allow assays such as an LE spot. And the Synergy LX is the newest generation of your multi-mode readers. And it was developed to fill the gap to be an entry-level multi-mode. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but it has the high quality detection and features that biotech is known for. And it also uses fiber free optics to uh, reduce any uh, loss of sensitivity with regard. Destination number three, we have sing single mode readers. So the absorbance readers, and there's two categories here when it comes to the biotech range. We have a filter based optics range and a monochromate. So the 800TS uh, is essentially the EL800. Uh, it's very popular in the biotech range, I'll often put it on the map. And it is this has the same workhorse technology that the EL800 was known for. It essentially just had a facelift with the touchscreen allowing for added convenience. And uh, thanks to this technology, we have readers in this range that uh, in the field for going on at 20 plus years and still going strong. So uh, real power and confidence in its performance there. And then we have the monochromator based optics. So this was taking the power 
of the monochromator and putting it in a small scale portable reader known as the Epoch. And uh, this has true flexibility. And if I don't know if you can appreciate here from screen, but the Epoch is tiny. It's about a microplate and a half in size. So when it comes to footprint, it really is utilizing the best of it. Uh, you're not going to waste too much space in that regard. And then we had the uh, new generation of the Epoch 2. And this was really taking everything that you love from the Epoch and just adding some additional features. You have incubation and shaking to allow for your kinetic assays, as well as the added flexibility through the cuvette port. And I know for a fact these the Epoch range is quite popular uh, in New Zealand. Uh, we have uh, one in Dundee at Otago, uh, which is used quite regularly. And lastly, but certainly not least, and we're finalizing in New Zealand, multi-plate readers. The Log Phase 600. This is a microbiology reader. It was designed specifically with this market in mind. And you can see that in its design. It is the only four plate uh, microplater plate reader in the market. And it actually utilizes industrial motors to enable continuous shaking, which is required for these microbiology assays. And the reason for this is because standard shakers are unfortunately not up to the task and will burn out uh, for these assays. And these actual uh, murders had 15 months testing for QC with zero failures. They put this through tried and true testing. The incubation in itself as well, there's sensors uh, to inform, and it's designed for the incubation required for these, uh, these assays as well. So you're having consistent and uniform incubation, also powered by the condensation control that uh, biotech in itself is known for. And you can see the uniformity in the results here as well. So when it comes to the log phase 600, you're having uh, consistent and um, uniform data so you can have confidence with that regard there. So thanks to this, the, uh, the log phase 600 fits in nicely with both uh, industry and academic labs alike. So just a quick summary here. So whether you have a subset or the flexibility for applications, uh, or you need a base or middle, top of the range, no matter what there is, there is an option for you. And this really here is just a subset of the applications that are possible with the biotech range. If I was to put all of the applications, this screen would be completely full and a nightmare and you would not know what you were looking at. So I just want to keep it nice and clean and simple. And of course, with, whether you have specific applications as well, there's options for you. So uh, I've managed to finish a little bit early, so hopefully we can recoup on our time. But if you do have any questions regarding the detection range, please give me an email. I'm happy to have a chat um, with any questions that you may have. Mm -hmm.